Uh, the CFEA, as it's uh, known as, is the, uh, the trade organization for the working professionals in Colorado in the film and, in, the film and television industry. So we represent them, we provide resources like like uh, the Filmmaker Focus program that you're here for today, um, networking events, other educational series, and um, you know, there's the, uh, as a member you also get a listing in our production guide where out of state and even, even in state productions can check the guide to kind of see if you get put together a crew and then um, you know, you're listed by your, by your skill set. So I encourage all of you to check out the website. That's Colorado, the, it's thecfba.com or just cfba.com. The Filmmaker Fo Focus Program is our educational program that we put on together with the Denver Film Society and the Colorado Film Commission. Uh, the three of us really, the three, us three organizations, really try to encourage this community um, to just get better, to constantly be improving themselves, to be making better films, to be making better content, um, and that's from everybody's uh, vantage point, from from better cin cinematographers getting better, to production designers getting better, to composers and, and editors getting better too. So um, I'm glad that everybody's here today, and hopefully we're here to learn a little bit about composing for film and, mute and, and for theater and for, um, what was the other one? Television. Television, television. <laughs> yes. Uh, television slash web, depending on how you watch your television. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up and introduce the moderate, moderator today. Uh, some of you may know him as Sean King, the drummer from Dvachka. Um Others may know him as the what, music ambassador of Colorado. Yeah, um, nice. The inaugural. The, yes, the inaugural ambassador, <laughs> music ambassador of Colorado. Um, and this today is this is really more of a focus, uh, a, a kind of a statewide Colorado initiative in, in the music world, where we're kind of we're working with the uh, the music district up in Fort Collins and also uh, the Colorado Creative Industries to really push and to get get our music industry in the state uh, just uh, a little bit further along. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sean. Thanks, guys. I think we might do the um, microphones off in a second. Once I get Kyle here, he's going to record this. What we're going to do today is um, we'll have a chat. I'll open it up to everybody, but we want to turn this into an audio podcast um, because this is part of a Colorado music strategy and not just a Denver music strategy, and, um, and that's the easiest way to get it out to them. So we do... Uh, we want to thank the the music district for making this happen in Colorado Creative Industries. Um, like Patrick was saying, I have a I have a role this year as a, a music ambassador, which is kind of still yet to be defined. But <laughs> but what it does definitely mean is that I get to connect the dots. Um, I get to meet you know great people like Denise and Tim and, and talk to them about what they're doing and and then. I, just get creative. Uh, Allison helped me put uh, this idea together, and I talked to my bandmate Tom Hagerman into <laughs> completing the panel. Um, do you want to hit record, Kyle? Is it record? I'll cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, so, so that's what the red light means. Uh, so, so yeah. And thanks to the Denver Film Society for hosting us too. Real quick, I want to just like show of hands, how many in the audience today are musicians? Um, how many would consider themselves more on the business side of music? Okay, and then how many uh, people do we have involved in film, whether it be editing, uh, video, or sorry, DP? Can I say DP? <laughs> how many DPs in the house? Um, and then have I have I forgotten anybody? Is there is there has has all hands gone up? Just no? regular people interested. Interested. Interested is good. No nothing. No, okay, that's good. That's a good place to start. You're gonna be our first two questions when we when I open it up at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna invite these guys up here. I'm gonna shut off this mic and cool it down. Um, Alright, so I'm not sure how to turn this off, but 
Okay. Thanks for being here, guys. Oh, cool. All right. So the first, the first thing I'm going to say is like, uh, can you introduce yourself and just give us, give me two sentences <coughs> about um, the current thing that you're working on that you're excited about musically. My name is Denise Gentilini. The current thing I'm working on is a uh, full-blown musical. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, uh, my name is Tom Hagerman, and the thing I'm really excited about right now is I'm writing a midlife crisis pop record. <laughs> <laughs> well my life is ending, and everything sucks. <laughs> uh, for the past couple of weeks, I did a TV show back in the 90s uh, called Wishbone, and um, back uh, for the last month, um, we have been pitching Mattel, who uh, controls the uh, character, and um, produced a short five-minute pitch uh, to Mattel to a group of us who are going to try to buy uh, the rights to get back into production for TV with that. And so uh, that's been a lot of fun to do, to get kind of the old band back together and hang out with those folks. Cool. All right. So um, I'm going to start with some questions, and we'll just uh, we'll see where it goes. But hold your, hold your questions um, audience questions till the end um, we won't we won't take up too much over here but um, let's just let's just make one clarification here we're talking about tonight we're talking about composing for TV film and theater which means you're working for hire and you're you're doing something specifically for uh, an, an action whether it's a video or a scene whatever it may be which is much different than getting a song licensed uh, that you have created, it's done, it has a life, and that piece of music is plugged into a production. So, so if, if you are in a band or want to talk about um, licensing, I think we can like, save that for another time. This is like specifically, um, specifically stuff that is for another purpose, not something that was created that gets synced. So, okay, you guys have an, a mountain of experience, um, and I, I want to ask, um, first, first and foremost, um, about education and, and being realistic in your day-to-day -day lives. How much did your education factor into what you do now? And what are your thoughts currently about uh, education and music and composing specifically? Tim? Uh, I started out uh, until I was about 30 years old as a, as a rock musician playing, you know, in bands and stuff like that and wanted to go back to school to get an education to uh, get into film composing and TV composing and uh, specifically study working with orchestras and stuff like that so that I could live in one city and you know, have a family, stuff like that, and so um, I think I think it can be lucky. You can do the education thing and get lucky, or you can do the education thing and maybe not get lucky, uh, and I just was extremely lucky that um, as soon as um, I was done with my education, and I had been doing work as a studio singer and a studio writer, but um, to get into uh, TV and film, uh, it, that bit of education that I got, that other degree, uh, really made all the difference for me. Cool. Go ahead, Tom. You want me to go? Uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, is like uh, I, I feel like um, so I went to CU Boulder for violin, and so I kind of was like a fairly serious violin student. And uh, you know, I say fairly serious because there's some people that like practice eight hours a day and went to Juilliard and stuff, and like I went to CU Boulder, which is fine, but like. You know, I didn't practice it on a state, uh, but I did good enough to like get. You know, I was in Boulder Phil and that kind of thing. But um, I, I don't think I would have got the same opportunities had I not sort of got to the level of, of proficiency that I got to to um, sort of keep it going with the rock band that I got into to sort of help it uh, sound a little more classy. I got these guys over here. <laughs> Time out. Tom and I, Tom and I play, we play in the same band, so if, if he ever like throws some 
people under the bus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I think it's important. I, th I think education is important. However, to get to the next step of of actually breaking into the industry, I don't. I you know, it's like you've got to like have a personality and you have to not just practice violin eight hours a day. <laughs> I was pretty much self-taught and for the longest time I thought it would just get me everywhere I wanted to go but then I decided that I wanted to learn the language that everybody was speaking so I went to college for three years just got an AA degree and I realized years later that I didn't learn a lot of things that I should have learned like orchestration and stuff like that but those are real specialized things so I took classes from uh, working film composers and got a little taste of what was involved and then just really dug in myself after that. And I think education gives you the confidence to have the gumption to make the phone calls and, and present yourself. And I think it's important to a certain point. And then, you know, you've got to do the rest of the work. Uh, we'll segue real quick. Um, your main musical acts, yours is? Keyboards. Tom? Violin. Tim? I'm a singer. Singer first. Yeah, and I play piano and guitar, but uh, I can read vocal music the best, and that's kind of the way I ask people is like, what's your best instrument that you read? And uh, if they say, you know, this, that, or the other, then that's the way I sort of define them. And for me, it's reading. I was a studio singer and stuff like that. Okay, cool. All right, now as far as, as far as like scoring goes, or, or, Things that were like composed to an action or to a specific project. What were like some of your early motivations for even attempting to do something like that? I saw the power that music had in film. That you can pull out the music from a scene and pretty much have like zero emotion, <laughs> um, you know, or fear or anything. And, and music really guided that so powerfully that I was very interested in being a part of that. Is there a specific score or song? Well, John Williams, okay. you know, is the best as far as I'm concerned. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about you, Tom? Uh, and with film, I, you know, I was a huge Danny Elfman fan uh, <laughs> growing up, and I listened to like, um, you know, like Piggy's Big Adventure, and I, the first record actually I ever sort of bought on compact disc. Um, the first record I ever bought was actually Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> the first compact disc I ever bought, though, was, uh, was Music for a Darkened Theater, and it was a compilation of all these Danny Elfman film scores, and um, I loved his, like, kind of quirky, dark uh, sort of take on things, and, you know, you could hear clips of, of classical music, and I grew up on classical music, too, so um, I, I loved all that. Uh, the, the thing that got me uh, into writing uh, for orchestral music and stuff like that was the impact that real human musicians make on a final track. And so uh, I got really active as a professional in 1980 and was doing a lot of singing and writing for corporate jingle stuff like that, a lot of ad music. And um, synthesizers were sort of, you know, getting their feet on the ground and even some early uh, sample packages of string libraries and things like that were happening and available. And it just always sounded so soulless to me that um, it was very important to me. I hear a giant difference in using human musicians um, as opposed to using anything else. And, uh, and so that really was the big motivator for me was to get myself in a situation where I spoke a language or could write down a, a, a chart or something that would allow me to sort of guide human musicians to what I was hearing because they always improved it infinitely. Was this outside of being inspired by any particular soundtrack? I, you know, I grew up as a movie fan um, all my life, and so I'm an old guy, and I, uh, my folks, there used to be a place in uh, St. Louis called Ronnie's Drive-In, and, and uh, the, the cost of admission was a dollar a carload, and so our family would get a six-pack of Pepsi and uh, a, pr a pressure cooker full of popcorn, and we'd go over and we'd, we'd watch movies every Friday night. So. Um, I've pretty much seen every movie that's been made since way before color, I think. And 
Um, and, and so my early influences as, uh, as a person who was interested in film music were composers like Bernard Herrmann. I think he's the greatest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Can you uh, give us some examples of his work? Um, for those who might not know. All the Hitchcock stuff. Psycho, you know, he wrote the shower scene and uh, he and Hitchcock weren't getting along at the time. And uh, when Hitchcock heard the shower scene music, he said, that's a pretty good start. Now you're getting there. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Vertigo and uh, you know, all, all, the, all the famous Hitchcock movies have Bernard Herrmann scores, but uh, even the last score that he did was Taxi Driver for uh, Martin Scorsese, and uh, that opening is a textbook of writing for low woodwinds. And so uh, just that kind of stuff, those composers, uh, John Barry, um, uh, you know, uh, his thing is like everybody play the melody, so uh, in Out of Africa and, and uh, the Bond films, all the stuff that he did, uh, he has a style. Dave Grusin, Quincy Jones, I don't know. All that music uh, that I would see in films really, really, really inspired me. So uh, I wanted to do that and, um, and quickly discovered that there's no way to do it except with a real bunch of humans in a room all playing real instruments. Yeah. Give me an example of, uh, and, and anyone can go first, give me an example of a score that you heard then went somewhere to find that score and learn what they were doing in that score. Because you just, you just mentioned how Bernard Herrmann is a, is a textbook example of writing for low winds, did you say? Yeah, low wood, wood winds. Okay. So the traffic scene in the rain as yeah. the opening credit roll in that movie. So, so get uh, any of you guys, anyone just fire one off. Give me, something, give me something that you heard and you're like, I gotta know how they did that. I don't know if it was something specific that I was listening to, but I went on to Sheet Music Plus to see what was available, and a lot of John Williams scores are available. Okay. There's a lot of other composers. When you, when, when you say scores, are you talking about the a, score. a, pi a piano score? So no, just two full, hands? full orchestral scores. Okay. Yeah, so, exactly how he wrote it. So just to be specific, a, a score is not a two-handed piano thing that you might find like uh, in Sam... G Sam Goody. <laughs> <laughs> Just dated myself right there. Uh, in Barnes and Noble, uh, a score is what? It's the full orchestra. It's this big, long sheet. Okay. All the parts. Okay. So, sorry. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> so, not every composer had their scores that they were willing to sell. They, uh, some people would do like an arrangement of somebody else's score. So, John Williams was the actual way he wrote it, and so I just started studying them, and the man uses all sorts of different time signatures. It's very complicated, but it, it's so educational. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> I could say recently the thing that I've had to, like, I had to write this piece of music for, um, uh, my friend Mark McCoyne is a percussionist, but he plays, <laughs> he bangs on a piano, like broken piano guts, basically, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they destroy pianos, and He's, he's great at it, but um, they wanted an orchestration to accompany this thing, and so, uh, but they're totally out of tune, so it's like you have to write this atonal accompaniment to like these things that they're just banging on, and um, so what kind of came to mind was um, uh, Johnny Greenwood's scores to uh, There Will Be Blood and stuff, but it's, it's sort of based on this older composer <laughs> named Penderecki, and um, so I had to kind of, I actually went back to Penderecki, but um, um, but it's the same principle of like trying to analyze how they sort of come up with the idea of um, it's just giant string glissandi that sort of smash up and down and but it, like a lot of these older film you know like any horror movie uses this technique and um, you can kind of see how they it works really well because it just it's the creepiest sound. Tell us about what's the one I know the one you're talking about. Threnody. But, but tell the yeah. one that you're talking about that. Uh, it's called Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima, and it's it's basically like it's not even standard notation. They, if you look at the score, it's just a bunch of lines and triangles, and they give you a legend like on a map. So there's a there's like a triangle <laughs> might mean that you pluck really high, and it's for written for like 52 strings, and there's like a ton of low bass and a ton of cello, and you know just a ton of strings, and so each little cue is uh, like for one minute you play like a very wide vibrato on. Um, you know, as high as you can, for instance, and then like a triangle will hit, and then, and then like you're supposed to just make this crazy sound. So it's, it just looks like total chaos, but it's like the most awesome organized chaos uh, that you could possibly see. But the thing is, it's like you, 
I, you kind of have to go back and like figure out how to translate that to an orchestra, which has like about you know two hours to learn it, and they're not going to be able to sit there and sort of like like look at this a bunch of lines. I actually did that when I did my thing. I I took colored pencils, and I did lines, and I sat there, and it took me forever because I didn't know what I was doing. But then I had to kind of go back and figure out how to notate it with standard notation. Anyways, it was a pretty educational experience. And, <laughs> I didn't make any money off of it, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's coming up. That, yeah. talk, that talk's coming up yeah. soon. <laughs> uh, Tim, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I just started out... Um, I was a piano player uh, when I was really young and accompanied church choirs and school choirs, and so um, I was able to hear what was going on in the orchestra, but I first started collecting scores way before I started collecting movie scores. I don't remember whether they were available or not. But I started with stuff like Ravel and Stravinsky and uh, scores like that where I would hear that stuff and wondered how they'd done that and, and started looking at that. And in earlier film music, I don't know, maybe before the 1960s or the 1970s, was, was pretty <coughs> typically um, Western classical music that uh, the, the composers were, were conductors. Bernard Herrmann was a conductor and, and they were composers uh, basically of Western classical music um, so that Ravel and Stravinsky and some of that other stuff that you would hear were what those guys were stealing from. And, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, but I you know, have a mountain of that stuff and um, just, I guess, could start hearing sort of what the instrumental sections were doing and hearing the harmonies and stuff like that. So I don't know if I have a, a very big collection of uh, contemporary film score or not. But anyway, that was just what happened to me. Yeah. Right on. Um, okay, cool. How about, um, I was thinking, let's talk a little bit about process for a minute. Like, um, you've got, you guys, ha you guys all play different instruments, and <clears throat> you have to start somewhere. So, you've got, you've got your, your indispensable tools for getting going. And um, let's first let's first talk about like physical things, hardware. In 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 the hardware world, what do you what do you have to have if you're going to make something? If you're going to create something new? Are you talking about like computer software? I wasn't going to say uh, software just yet, but like um, let's just open it up. Software or hardware? What do you need? What's like what's the what's the bare bones of what you need to start writing? Like, could you could you just be like singing into your iPhone um, <laughs> on a walk with your dog, and then turn that into a full fledged score? Like, give us a little bit about like what's that what's that process for you? Well, you just reminded me. Um, I started writing this musical in 2014 with uh, a longtime collaborator friend of mine, and I have a full blown studio, and the studio was on, and she sat with her iPhone, and we literally wrote what amounted to like 37 songs with just me playing the piano and her singing. Going into an iPhone mic. Yes. And she emailed me everything. <laughs> and wow. then I went back and created the production around all of that. So yeah, the iPhone made it really simple, but it was really funny to see us sitting in this room, and that's what we chose to use. It was, it's quick. <laughs> so, real, so real piano, real voice, iPhone. Well, electric. OK, electric yeah. piano. Yeah. OK. Yeah, and the iPhone. And what's your, what's your go-to piano in the electric world? Well, I have an acoustic piano upstairs. I've got a Yamaha, beautiful grand piano. No one touches it. <laughs> <laughs> no one touches it without washing your hands. I'm kind of weird that way. Um, because sample software has gotten so good. Sorry. Really no, sorry. No, no, it really has. <laughs> I've, uh, got, I've got everything. Yeah, it's just it's easier to just do it with that than to mic the piano. And even though my piano is a sin clavier, it's, it's right. MIDI, I can record it and right. then trigger it with the computer. It's just easier to do it with the uh, sample sounds. And what's that, what is that sample that you go to I typically? Have, uh, typically, Alicia's Keys. Okay, Yeah. I know that one. <laughs> Tom, how is about you? Is actually what's Alicia Keys sample? It's called yeah. Alicia's, Alicia's Keys. Keys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what's it? What's the, like? It, yeah, you're starting. You you need to get going, and you've got nothing. What's the what's the either software or hardware or both? What's the first thing that 
I think it depends on the project for me. The, uh, like, like if there's if it's sort of a commercial gig and like you just have to sort of get the shit done. Like you just I just throw up a mic and start like it's usually violin actually. Okay. If, um, well, it depends on like what the thing is. Like if it like is more of a poppy thing, I might get into <clears throat> Logic and like sequence something on like the fake sense and then I might like take my my you know moog and run the midi through and um but, but it it totally depends on the project I might um just bang on a piano for a little while or um yeah it's just totally different each time for me I, I think the thing that has changed for me the most is you know the production schedule has gotten so compressed that up until about 1990, um, when I was writing, um, I would do it with pencil and paper, sitting at a piano, and you'd have the director come over and you'd go, and then the strings are going to go da 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 da, <laughs> and uh, the, the you know director would go, great, get the orchestra in, let's do it, and and then as the technology got a lot better uh, and the schedules got a lot shorter for music production. Um, we started what I'd call Polaroids, so that you'd get a locked print and, um, and you'd compose to it using software that locked to the print and use uh, samples and, and synthesizers so that when the director would come over, you could just push a button and he'd watch his scene with, and he could hear what the orchestra was going to sound like. No imagination necessary as far as him imagining what the music was going to sound like. It was going to sound like that only better, and uh, and so once that started happening, everybody expects that now. When you go to to have a, a review of the work you've got ready to bring before the orchestra, and um, and it's good. It makes things a little faster, um, uh, and so I I've, I've got a ton of stuff, and my go-to uh, I've also got a nice Yamaha piano, but my go-to software instrument is a new thing from Germany by the C. Beckstein Company, uh, and it's their digital grand, but I've got, I've got all the other stuff too, and uh, you know, so these piano sounds are so good and so close that I really doubt that um, the film people would hear the difference. Both of you haven't said that something's got to control that, like what is, what's the controller that is talking to the software? What's your go-to controller, like uh, your MIDI keyboard? I have a Roland. I can't remember the name of it. It's a Roland. Okay. Full 88 key. Okay, cool. Tim? I've got a bunch of them. I've got a Kurzweil. <clears throat> I've got a Yamaha. I've got the new uh, NI Native Instruments thing where the keys light up. And uh, so it just depends on what's hooked up usually. Okay. It's not, it's not like one specific one that you'll use. No, I you know, used to be a little bit finicky about having them feel a little bit like a piano, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> right on, right on. Uh, so it's, I mean, I, the thing I keep hearing is that uh, speed, it's like speed is everything, because if you don't want to go upstairs or you, you don't want to plug in a different keyboard, it just seems like the, the thing that's most accessible. So here's a, th here's a thought. Uh, I, I was thinking today that uh, back in the day, I bought software thinking that everything would change. Um, and I learned really quick that it was just it was just a, a baby step in the process that buying new software meant that I needed to learn the new software. Um, and in reality, I think I would have been a lot better off playing more piano to help my learning process. So, um, so what do you think is the greatest misconception about what's what's the greatest misconception about? learning to compose or learning to score. Does that make sense? Like, you, you think you're going to, like, you think you're just going to hit this, like, stride or something. Like, what, what's, what's happening behind the scenes? Like, what's the, what's the tricky part? Well, the, what, the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's not about you. It's not, I mean, you are providing something that is going to sit underneath and support. It can't distract. It can't be the focus. Um, you don't want people to stop noticing what they're watching and think, wow, oh, it's really pretty music. You know, you've really not done your job. So I, I think that having the knowledge of what film scoring is, what it's supposed to, um, you know, provide to a film is really important. And obviously, 
knowing how to use your stuff. New, y your, using your stuff. Using your, um, you know, like buying software is one thing. Right. Knowing how to use it is like even more important because <laughs> anybody can buy software and um, sample libraries and, and just play and think, oh, you know, this is really cool, this sounds great, but there is a lot of skill and finesse involved in that, especially when you're doing mock-ups, which is what Tim was talking about, for directors who don't really have an imagination, and, and it is now pretty much, you know, the precedent that they expect to come in and, and hear what the orchestra is really going to sound like, so you really have to do the mock-up, and you've got to be really skilled at knowing how to use the software to create something that is realistic enough mm -hmm. that they can have an idea of what it would sound like with human beings. Um, you know, it's funny, I just heard this NPR story about, uh, did anybody hear this? It's, it's about a computer program that they created to write with music, like, and it's, uh, for 99 cents you can buy a piece of original music that is um, designed by a computer, and it's mostly for <laughs> YouTube video. I don't know because you got me thinking about software, but yeah, no, it's, um, it's distracting. But it, uh, this program basically, like it's just sort of designed to put everybody out of work in a way. <laughs> um, but yeah, for ninety nine cents, if you're one like a small company, you can buy a tune that that will, you know, you just type in like sad song with drums, bass, and you know, <laughs> it will spit out this thing and yeah. they give it to you, bam, for ninety nine cents. And then if you're a big corporation, it's like twenty one dollars. Well create the same thing. Um, so it's interesting, I don't know, I feel like we're going in this brave new world and we continually go into this new world of technology that um, is kind of frightening, but um, um, I guess the learning curve there is you wouldn't need to learn anything because you just like, uh, do it. But I, I mean, for me, it's like if there's not a certain level of musicianship involved, like when you go into the, the process to begin with, you never get the correct f feeling out of the product that you do, that you make. But, um, but this technology is scary. I think, it's scary. <laughs> I, I think I just want to talk about a couple of different kinds of music because that sort of informs the hurdles that you're going to have to go through to be successful creating that kind of music. And so the kinds of music that are popular right now are kinds of music like EDM that's created with a software application called Ableton, among um, many others. But it's sort of a cut and paste sort of software. So even people without musical training or without musical skills who might have a, a critical ear can create something that's, that's interesting. And then another kind of score might be a hybrid score where you combine some <clears throat> orchestral instruments and, and sounds and uh, some electronic instruments and sounds. And as we get more humans involved in the process, all the way over to a score that is, let's say, 100% um, actual humans playing instruments, um, then the thing that becomes important for me is the word idiomatic, is that a, is that a word that is, is too frightening? It just means that you write music in, the, in a way that when a violin player or a real guitar player sees the dots that you put on the page, they understand, they hear it. Mm -hmm. And so people who only work with synthesizers and have never studied how people make music on real instruments and stuff like that, when they put notes down, you've got to hope that you've got a, a compassionate violinist who will go, I see what you mean and I'll play this and that'll be it, it'll be close enough. So I think that the training for is more important the closer you get to requiring real human performances to realize your music. and. And that involves uh, some training in counterpoint and orchestration and theory and, and some of that stuff. But the samples are getting so good now that, you know, people with uh, discerning ears can pluck out stuff with these sounds and just go, that sounds like a film score. And a lot of times they're right. A lot of times it works great. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of things um, behind the scenes that people don't realize. And I think it's getting more complex with software, um, let's, we can come back to some more process stuff if people want to uh, talk about that. But I, I requested that you guys bring um, a video to to talk about um, stuff that you've been doing or a story. Like, let us know like a little bit about some more of the process. So like, so Tom, I'll, I want to play your video first <laughs> with this. 
<laughs> Please cue Tom's video. That is so high tech. <laughs> All right. Do you want to set it up first? Okay. <laughs> Tom's going to set it up first. Well, I was going to. Oh, okay. Well, so this video that you are about to <laughs> see, it's a. Uh, for over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of orchestration for the Colorado Symphony for their pop show. This has nothing really to do with like synced music to film or, but I've been doing a lot of arranging work, and so it's been a huge source of both like frustration and pride and some <laughs> a little bit of money here and there. Um, but um, but this whole thing, it's this, so I did the. Uh, there's this band, the Lumineers, are like really big around here, I guess. Um, that's a joke, but they're huge. Uh, so, uh, so anyways, I did, I arranged seven songs for them, and um, they, this one song, um, their drummer, Jeremiah, was like, I, I just watched Stand By Me, and I really like the intro to Stand By Me, and can you write this big intro? And the thing about when you arrange for orchestra, for pop shows, it's like, you don't get paid anymore to do better. <laughs> so... But the thing is, Stop it's like the tape roll. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like it's such a wasted opportunity. Like if somebody hands you an orchestra, like, well, I'm gonna just like write shit because like because I can. You know, it's better to like because it's like the best players in the whole state and mm -hmm. beyond. And you're like, well, you really want to do something well for them. But uh, so, anyways, Jeremiah watched Stand by Me, and um, he's like, I really like that. Can you do an intro for this first song? So that's what this is. And I think you might have started like halfway through, but. This is a, something that um, CPR recorded it, so it was like, uh, this is a rehearsal, anyways. Play Tom's video, there you go. please. <laughs> Glad you rolled it through the credits because what's interesting here is that I'm not credited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> man, we're gonna go, we're gonna go all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, we'll get a drink and Tom will tell you all about the details. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, right. So, um, so yeah, what do you? What's your takeaway from that? What's your takeaway from? Well, the, I, it's like okay, so well, when somebody writes a pop song, uh, well, okay, usually when you you write a song. There's sort of two components that sort of is the money part, and it's melody and sort of, and harmony basically. And it's interesting because they, if you've heard this before, that if the laws of, of music were written by a black man, it'd be about who owns the groove. Did we talk <laughs> about this? Heard that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And uh, maybe you even told me that. But um, but anyway, so like uh, Lumineers owns this song, and then you know they hire me to do this thing. It's fine. Like it's work for hire, and it you know it's fine. But but I, it, it is funny because like. I did uh, the Flaming Lips. Uh, this is funny. I was <laughs> going to be recorded. Uh, like, anyway, I did Flaming Lips. It was awesome. It was like, the, it, to me, it's the Soft Bulletin record, which if you, any of you know that record, it's like, it's sort of their best record. Yeah. And they, like, there's tons of, like, MIDI or, you know, kind of fake orchestration, French horns. And they didn't have, like, the budget to do a real orchestra. But um, I, was, I got the opportunity to orchestrate the thing and add my own sort of twist on it. And, um, but it, it was funny because Wayne Coyne gets up there at the end, you know, and he like 
he like thanks the orchestra and he thanks the conductor and he's like and it was like ah like I'm the only guy that spent like all like three months working <laughs> yeah. on this. Thing. <laughs> well, listen, okay, so so going back to what Denise said, it's like you're you have okay, you're a work for hire. You have to fit in without being too obvious. Do you feel like arranging for like how so how is that how is that different with arranging for a band because it's got to be it's kind of similar it's a work for hire you're 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 embellishing something that already exists right well i mean i think it's different like if you're writing for film or or, or video you're still um well you're the composer and you it's your sort of musical <coughs> idea that you're adding to the bigger picture i think versus when you're composing for a rock band um, you are adding your musical idea to the bigger picture, however, you're erased. <laughs> I think. I, I mean, it's different. Like, we're talking about Bernard Herrmann, John Williams, and uh, this is my narcissistic ego that you're, I'm just throwing it all out there. But, you know, we're, I mean, we talk about these, these film composers, and, and it, it is true because you see these great partnerships. Like, they had arrangers. George Lucas. Well, John, they did have arrangers, but um, does anyone know who John Williams' arranger is? Th that's true. Yeah, I, I have I no don't. idea. I don't. I, no I think idea. he uses different people. Um, Conrad team. Pope has done stuff for him, but orchestrating. Gotcha. You know, there's terminology and there's definitions. There's mm -hmm. a definition for an arranger. There's definition for an orchestrator, and they all really get blurry. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, I never. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, they get. They get. No, they get blurry. Um, Okay, so let's talk. As, uh, if of your two videos, do either of you want to talk about something that relates to process, like how things? How, uh, Tim, do you want to go next with the one? I've just got a really stupid story oh. about my video. <laughs> okay, all right. I thought it was like you, uh, no, but I mean, do you want to go? No, no, talk I'm, about I'm interested in the stupid story now. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know about you guys, but I love war stories that have to do with making films or making records or you know so. So this is a war story. You all are familiar with the Latin phrase, sic transit gloria mundi. That means that all glory in the world is fleeting. So Wishbone opened on 350 TV screens across America and in Canada, and it was on eight times a week for seven or eight years. But the first night it was on, we'd assembled the cast and the crew, and we'd taken over a sports bar and flipped all the TV sets to PBS, and when the show started and the credits started to roll and we saw our names on the screen, it was like for that one moment we were just really, really proud. And as soon as the show was over, I turned to my 10-year-old son and I said, what do you think of that? And he said, oh, I thought it was funny. And I said, what part did you think was funny? He said, it was really funny when your name shot out of the dog's butt. <laughs> so, so, here for you tonight, let me play for you the wishbone opening with my theme song and what is probably my most widely seen television credit, shooting out of a dog's butt. <laughs> Uh, his name was Soccer. 
Uh, and he was a Hollywood dog. Uh, Jackie Captain was the trainer. Her husband trained grizzly bears and horses and stuff, and she trained the littler animals. And we found her after an exhaustive search of dog breeds. And, uh, and Soccer. Soccer. We had three dogs. We had Soccer, Phoebe, and uh, I can't remember the other dog's name. We called him Gump Bone because he was a puppy, and uh, we used him to do all the dangerous stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so if there was a water gag or something like that, you know, Gump Bone would do it. And if there was fire or horses, Gump Bone. If the dog was jumping over the camera and PBS didn't want to see any dog junk in on t kids' TV, then Phoebe would, would get the call. So, no dog junk on PBS. <laughs> no dog junk on I don't know, maybe now. Oh, man. Um, well, cool. These, this, they, these are really going to go um, in all different directions because Denise is a, is a, is a bit of a, almost music activism, I, I think you could say, right? Um, do you want to set it up for us? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, most of the jobs that I've gotten doing music for documentary films have been films that I've pursued because I was interested in the subject matter. And since, since we're talking about money, or none, <laughs> um, I always have to care about what I'm working on, especially if I'm not getting paid the amount of money I'd like to get paid. So this was one of those situations where um, it was a very great story. The, the film was about um, openly gay politicians running for office and what they had to deal with by being out. And um, so this is the opening credits, and it's just a piece of it. but. It was so negative and hateful that I, I think, had I not been gay, it still would have bothered me. Mm -hmm. That the funny part of it is that I actually got sick <laughs> when I was working on this opening scene. I got really ill, and I thought, it's the negative energy in the house. I saged my studio. I went online and I bought those salt lamps and filled the room with it. I mean, there's like orange glow. I mean, I did everything I could to just get through just the opening scene. The rest was bad too, but just you'll see in this opening scene, it was so hateful. So it was quite the challenge. Gotcha. All right. Did I? I'm, I'm all caught up in your story. I forgot to. Uh, whoops. Sorry, guys. Cue Denise's and run, please. No homo. This is a rap perversion. He said, I'm normal. You're not normal. I'd like to energize the conservative Christian base in uh, Houston and get them out to vote. Out to vote against Anise Parker. She's pictured at the front alongside her longtime partner under the headline, Is This the Image Houston Wants to Portray? I remember when Elaine Noble first ran for office in Massachusetts, and she had to have two state troopers with her at all times to protect her life. Her house window was smashed, her car towers were slashed. How do you feel about open homosexuals tending to your child in a health care setting? Build a great, big, large fence electrified where they can't get out. In a few years, they'll die out. I was cornered after school by some older kids who roughed me up. They said that I was a faggot and that I should die and go to hell where I belong. It's not a tragic news story about a growing problem in schools across America, bullying. This grader's parents say he was picked on at his Massachusetts school by students who called him gay, said he was feminine. Carl later hanged himself. And the Gay Straight Alliance Club reaches out to these kids, and then they start adopting a gay identity. This is a system for recruiting kids into homosexuality. Dads, the second you see your son dropping the limp wrist, you walk over there and crack that wrist. Give him a good punch. Damn, wow. Well, oh man, that's gotta be tough. Um, let's, that might, that might lead into what comes next, I think, which is important. And I want, I want people who are thinking about composing as an actual profession. Um, let's talk about the value of your work because um, I think this is one of the situations where um, you you obviously believed in, in, in attaching your name to this project. Um, and let's just let's just start by saying uh, there's a there's a 
strange. There's a there's an insane amount of uh, unbalance with it, like you know, pay for jobs that are cool versus you know, uh, no pay for jobs that aren't cool. Like it's it, there's no there's no real balance to it. I mean, I think it's safe to say we've all been paid too much for something that was kind of a, a joke to us and way too little for something that was super dear to our hearts. Does that go without saying? Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's a standard. So, um, let, uh, so how do you develop an inner compass to value your work? Well, I think regardless of what you're getting paid, your name is going to be attached to it for eternity. Whether, you know, it, it could just get put on a shelf somewhere or it could become huge. So you need to go into these things and give it your best. I mean, it can't be, you can't do a, a, a score that's like commensurate with what you're getting paid because no one's going to know that. So you've got to do your best job or don't do it at all. I mean, that's always kind of been my theory. That's why I, I have to care about what I'm working on, because I'm probably not going to get paid what I think I'm worth. That's good advice. Yeah. Tom? Um, yeah, I think that about sums it up, really. I mean, for me, it's more about just trying to figure out when to turn down things. Um, I like, I, I mean, I try to do, every, I try to say yes to everything, really, but um, I find that at various points, it's like suddenly, like I'm just so slammed, I can't think straight, and then suddenly I have nothing to do for two months, you know. And, um, but uh, yeah, I don't think you can actually. Um, I mean, you know, there's certain things like if Halliburton calls you up, you might, you might be like, cool, I'll, I'll do it because I really need money. But like, I don't like Halliburton, so like, maybe I won't do it. If you if you have the ability to do that, but I, it's hard as a musician to turn down stuff. I, I find because you feel like a miss, it, you just missed out. Um, so I try to tend to take everything and then try to put my best foot forward, but and then I just kind of go insane. <laughs> I think for me, I I like to have fun when I'm working, and and a lot of times the deadlines are short, and the the money may not be you know what you need to do what you want to do with the project, but if um, there's a good relationship with the film side of the thing, like I I really especially try to work on projects where I've got a relationship with the director uh, and not, I'm not working with a committee. Uh, and if that happens and it looks like uh, the director's got a sense of humor and knows what kind of music he or she wants, um, then I'm real eager to start a project like that. Uh, and uh, as far as the money goes, um, I've just been really lucky to be able to um, <coughs> work on projects where I had the budget at least to do um, use real instruments and so uh, s sort of my cop out is I will pay myself less sometimes if the project looks like fun I've got a relationship with the director and there's enough money there for me to put together a nice chamber orchestra or an appropriate collection of instruments for whatever the project is uh, and, and then um, that excites me but uh, just like everybody else, I, I try to say yes to everything and, um, and you know, when the money's bad and you don't have enough money to hire the band you want to hire and the people are crabby and they haven't done the production schedule correctly so that they're scheduling uh, presentations of the final thing as soon as they lock the picture and the audio, uh, the, the recording of the score is sort of an afterthought that they shove in between when the picture's locked and when they've got their first money meeting or whatever. Uh, that gets real old, and it happens to everybody, I think, but um, but I prefer the other. <laughs> cool. Um, I think I just have one more question before we open it up to some questions from you guys. Um, and this, this does actually relate to what you're talking about with paying musicians or having a budget for musicians. Um, there's, there's some popular composers now that are only using synths and doing more of like uh, very electronic scores. Cliff Martinez, who used to play drums for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he did he did Drive, the movie with Ryan Gosling, and um, that's all synth. Um, there's a movie called Under the Skin with Scarlett Johansson, and, and uh, woman who composed that is 
uh, Micah, Levi, um, and then you guys probably have seen Trent Reznor's um, social network. Um, Micah Levi's score particularly is one to check out because it's haunting, it's it's scary as shit, and it's um, there's not a whole lot of uh, I've, I he listened to it and I think that someone didn't have she's she's an accomplished composer but I, I think someone with little composition background could have made that score because it's just it's it's sound to make you feel uncomfortable for the entire score what do you guys think um, about about that kind of like departure from classic even Disney scoring, you know, like take something like Moana and it's a giant orchestra with the best, you know, most popular, best um, songwriters. Um, and then there are these other people who are like putting on headphones and turning on their synth. So just real quick, like where's scoring heading in your opinion? Well, I think once making films became so <coughs> accessible to people that they're doing it on their iPhones, then you you've now created a whole group of people who aren't going to have a budget for an orchestra. Mm -hmm. you know. And add to that music licensing or um, buying you know, something that you can tailor make for your scenes. And, the, and there's <coughs> even um, software that it's real orchest orchestral sounds, but they've basically composed the melody for you. So you're literally just like Ableton, you're piecing things together. So there's so many options on how to do it, and you're always going to have the people who can't afford a real live orchestra, and there's nothing like humans. There, there, there's nothing that's going to emulate that as well as the real thing, but it's the big studios that have the budget for that. Mm -hmm. So it's just you've got the whole gamut of, of ways to write music to film, and it's just about being capable of doing as much as you can mm -hmm. and making it affordable so that at least the music, if the film's not great and it's low budget, at least the mu music's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, I mean, I, I don't know where the future of music's, I, I think maybe possibly the future of music will be this computer, pr I think we'll all be replaced by computers actually, <laughs> <laughs> really, but um, everybody. Uh, but I, I think it, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, like I like all kinds of music, and I think uh, like some movies and certain scenes or commercials or whatever you're doing calls for just a like eerie synth, you know. It might just be one note, you know, um, versus having a full orchestra, um, you know, regardless whether you have the budget or not. And so I, I think a lot of that stuff is awesome, you know. Uh, if it works, if the shoot fits, I guess, you know, I, I think it's cool. But um, but I think it's good to like to, to go back to you know I I think also like. We keep um, people now, kids and stuff too, are, are growing up on sounds that like they're not they're not watching like Looney Tunes cartoons where you have these amazing scores and this, you know Carl Stalling who wrote all that stuff was like this kind of ge mad genius and and the the orchestrations were brilliant and and um, you know now it's like Daniel Tiger where like I know your kids watch it my kids too but. Um, it's just all these bleepy midi and like everything's auto tune and Daniel Tiger's like, mm, you know, and like, like, like it's all. Wait, what's he like? Yeah, <laughs> like, well, I, you know how auto tune works. Like you can hear it and it's like, my God, like kids, like this is not how people sing and do. And so, I think though, if you if you don't have music education like from the beginning and and we don't in public schools these days and uh, people's ears start getting attuned to like fake instruments and soon enough you can sell them. A fake instrument, and they don't know any better. So yeah. I'm afraid that that's where things are going, but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, having firmly planted my flag on using real musicians, I think that the goal of a of music with film, let's say, or with TV or with theater, is to uh, help tell the story primarily, and then uh, second is to convey uh, some sort of emotional message. Uh, and uh, and so. Uh, I don't know anything about the score for The Revenant, but it, I, I saw that and I thought it was very strange and beautiful and really fit the movie and I didn't recognize a lot of, you know, it sounded electronic to me, I have no idea. But I think that electronic stuff is fine, I think, it's, I think it can be just as successful. Um, again, I think the most important thing uh, when you're working 
with somebody else to use music to help tell the story is a, a development process that allows the people to start to work together as a team and, and use what film can provide and use what music can provide, uh, you know, because together they, they, they're, the, they're much greater than the, the, you know, initial frame or the initial sound. And so um, I, I, I love electronic music and I think it works great, like you were saying. Some things call for it, and, and uh, I think that's when it's appropriate. Cool, cool. Uh, questions from you guys? Um, actually, this gentleman right here. <laughs> the one who doesn't know anything. <laughs> I'm an architect, so I do understand design, but I don't understand music at all. So like in your opening with the, the gay documentary, did they have the film done and then give it to you to score the music, or do you work with it? How does What's the order? Usually the film is done, although some people who are doing their first film will make changes after they've given it to the composer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's always fun. First film? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and like we've all been talking, you're like the last thing in the process. So you have a very short window of time to complete a job. And they're like liter literally, you know, are you done yet? Are you done yet? You know, because they're done. But um, yeah, no, it comes finished. So how, when you look at that score, you're sitting there and you're going to have to determine a music, of, a music score for it. How do you come up with what the tune is or what the melody or what the instrumentation will be to match that film? Well, I watch the whole thing several times and I decide who are the characters that are prominent enough that it would warrant them having a theme. And then every time you see them on the screen, I make sure their theme comes back. So you connect that with them, and it's this subliminal thing. Um, with documentaries, I find that there's so much talking that you're really just sitting underneath and not getting in anybody's way. And in this particular project, which it's not a score that I'm um, is my favorite, although there were segments that I really loved. Um, there was a scene at the end where they basically wove a bunch of things together and, and there was no dialogue. And they said, okay, you know, we want something really, you know, that, that moves along underneath this. And I thought, yay, no one's talking. I can do whatever I want. I did this melodic thing and all this. They came back and they said, can you do a little less melody? Mm. <laughs> really? This was my moment. <laughs> so it, it's tough with documentaries. Ted? So um, what genre of film or TV or, or whatever content that you haven't already uh, composed for would you be most interested in composing for? Anybody? Um, I don't, I don't know that I'm open to stepping outside of my comfort zone. I know what I'm good at. Um, if somebody handed me a comedy, I might consider that. A horror film? No. That was pretty much a horror film. Um, <laughs> I, I like to be able to um, make people cry. And I don't say that in like this, you know, yeah. <laughs> but I, I really feel like I'm good at doing that. So I, I tend to lean towards those things. You guys? Um, are you talking any medium? Like, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, it, de it depends. Like I, like, I would love to do just like, I mean, you know, I, like, I loved like Amelie and I loved like all those like French, like I think it'd be kind of cool to do something really artistic like that, um, but like, Recently, I, I did this thing for this dance company, and they gave me complete um, creative freedom, and they gave me 13 string players from the Colorado Symphony, and like, I, get, I guess ultimately I prefer to be doing things like that, where it's just like, just go for it, and like, here's a bunch of great musicians to write for, and here's your check. And like, that, that to me is like the ideal situation, whether whatever medium like that would be the ideal situation, but I know that's not generally how it works, but <laughs> did experience it once. <laughs> <laughs> I think what he said is, is accurate, that you know any project where 
you're sort of turned loose to work with the materials uh, that come from the other folks is a lot of fun, especially when there's a budget and stuff like that. Um, I, I think that as long as there's a story and as long as um, what Denise was saying about the uh, editorial process where if it's a documentary, it's just not, you cut to a shot and the guy's already talking and then they cut to another shot and the guy's already talking. Uh, some of the best editors I've worked with were musicians who heard the music before it was even written. They heard that there was going to be a musical transition here. So as, as long as there's a little breathing room for music to help tell the story, uh, I'm up for anything. I've never done horror movies and since I've been here three years now and I've noticed that a lot of folks are doing great horror movies and uh, <laughs> I've never done one, and I'd love to do one of those. Uh, so, you know, John, do you folks? Because um, I know I, as a composer, struggle with this. Do you often land up working with temp, temp cues from the director, from the editor, mm -hmm. and do you have and do you struggle with them? I actually, or or are I they a, a bonus sometimes when there is a temp track yeah. because then you know what mm -hmm. they had in mind. When they get so attached to it <laughs> that now you're just trying not to copy it. Um, that's tough. You might want to explain. I don't know if everybody knows what it is. Oh, yeah. He, uh, he was just asking, um, are you guys given examples that have a temp track, which means that the director has put music into their edit and has now given you that edit, and you're, you're, given, you're given a film with dialogue and another audio track that you can usually mute, and now you have to write to it, but you have to constantly refer back to what they were thinking of in their head. Um, I, you know, I kind of wish I did. So I did this. Uh, it was like a YouTube commercial for Cost Plus World Market, and the temp track was actually a Devotchka song. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, I had to sit there and kind of try to copy these, this thing that we did that like, <laughs> you did. Uh, to change it enough to not have to pay you and Nick and Jamie. The irony. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> uh, 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 so do I? I don't really prefer that, but I understand. Were you, were you laughing that you were the only one getting paid? <laughs> well, well, not much money. Like not for what you think cost plus, like yes, whatever. But um, uh, I mean, I get why people do it, and um, it is nice to have a reference to kind of figure out. But I do find that people do get attached to it, and then ultimately they wind up wanting something really similar to that. I did another thing where they were like, they kept trying to get me to do stuff. And I did all these, and it was just the ending of this thing. And um, they kept wanting me to change it. Finally, they're like, you know what we want is like this song in Inception. We, who's the film composer for that? Hans Zimmer. Yeah, exactly. And so they sent me the track, and I was like, okay, cool. And I just, I had to admit, I lifted the chord progression like verbatim, and I just sort of changed the timbres and stuff. I'm probably going to get sued this now. Being we are filming. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's what happened, and it, uh, it worked. I, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I prefer to to uh, sort of have a relationship with the director and hear what the director's listening to generally. Uh, but if the scene's been, if the scene's a chase scene or some high tempo scene and it's been edited and there's a lot of editorial information that is conveyed by listening to the temp track, it's hard to beat having a temp track to start with. Uh, but again, what both of you were saying is that at some point they're going, no, go ahead and break the law. You know, I, no, don't read what you signed on the contract that you know you're indemnifying us against uh, infringement, go ahead and make it exactly <laughs> like the <this. laughs> same. So that, that's, you know, at that point, yeah. you have to have a cup of coffee and a talk. M my struggle has been that they would say, oh no, do your own thing, do your own thing. But what you're discovering eventually is they brainwash themselves with that temp and then you've got to try and work around that. To Let me just add something else trying? to that though. I think um, the good thing about the temp music is that it kind of defines where they imagine music being. And they don't have to tell you. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's helpful for them. It's helpful for an editor, too. Editors like to edit to music. Yeah. So it, it has some good Oh, points. absolutely. Oh, yeah. uh, we recently uh, did a project with some friends and recently used a, a program called Frame.io. It's on, an online service. And you can actually, if you get a job and, and you really want to request no reference track and just go with the vibe you can actually get them to put the video you're scoring to on frame io and as it's rolling just like a 
just like a, a comment on SoundCloud or something, it'll just drop in and it's like, I'm kind of thinking music will start here and you'll see it in time. <laughs> and that's really helpful because you know, you don't, even, you don't even have to have a conversation with this person. It's like, this is where I think it'll start. And I'm thinking about <clears throat> these bands or these moods or whatever. So um, there are some ways around it. Um, did you have a question over here? Yeah. Um, how would you approach a situation where you have a live stream that's unpredictable, but you need to have something in the background to uh, tie it together with the environment? Uh, this is, I'm a bit of an activist here. And I, say, for example, I'm going to be running live streaming of uh, underwater reef fish and whatever you see from a rover that's moving through the reef. How would you paint the background for that with music? That sounds super fun. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really fun. Wow. Um, go ahead, guys. Any? any? Uh, I, I think, are you aware of a style of music called ambient music? Elevator. Brian Eno? No, not elevator music. No. <laughs> <laughs> music that changes in ways that you don't really notice. Music that's composed to convey a mood or a feeling, but you don't necessarily, you're not, the music doesn't pull focus to the transitions that it's making. It's, the transitions are generally gentle, and the compositions are generally longer pieces of music, like Brian Eno's last album, I think the first cut was 30 minutes long. And uh, I think music like that would be appropriate for that sort of stuff. And I think music generally can work against the grain anyway. I, a lot of times, uh, some of the best stuff is, uh, you know, a, a, a car chase with just a solo alto flute, you know, against it or something like that. It just depends on, it depends on what the footage looks like for sure. You'd want it to feel inviting and comfortable. As well. yeah, I get Brian Eno's new album and check it out. You might like that. Mm -hmm. okay. This is a live stream. Like I mean, this is like live. Like this rover's like ro run, like rolling around. See, I mean, what I I think it would be cool is if you just like got a bunch of dudes with a bong and like just sat there and <laughs> recorded it live and like you know what I mean? Music like had like live music. <laughs> Play for as long as you could keep it. these guys going. Have you, have you got my else. number? <laughs> <laughs> We're like, I, there's this place in Rangeley, Colorado called The Tank. Do you, have you heard yeah. of this place? It's like a giant water tank. or It was never used, but they saw it, a pole in it, and it's this massive reverb container. But like something like that, if you just let, had live, you could somehow stream the music live while you're doing this live would be really cool because it, like, like the, the reverberation in that tank would be amazing, I think, for something. Is that Bruce Sodland's project? I don't know who did it. It's like, I don't know. You know who Mark McCoyne was involved, that guy yeah. that I did the things for, but um, uh, he he was somehow involved. There's a bunch of kind of um, older, like, hippie sort of dudes that were involved with it. But um, they saved and they attached a recording studio to it, I think, as well. I've never been there. It looks awesome, though, from the website. So. Um, any stu how about all the way in back? Hi. Um, so I'm sort of kind of coming from the other end of both creative direction and writing, right? So when I'm writing or putting something together, I really do write in terms of I can hear like the music in my mind. And when I'm putting together events, I can hear the music, but I'm not a musician. I run a music organization, but I can hear it. And for, I'm putting together my own podcast, and I, I can hear the music. And so my question is advice for me on the other side and folks on the other side of working with musicians. I always struggle with how to convey what what I'm hearing as a non-musician and what's sort of going on in my creative process and allowing the musicians that I'm commissioning to feel not how you all feel sometimes. Like, oh yeah, they said we can have freedom, but we don't have freedom and they just want us to do exactly what they say. So I just, what advice would I think what I would suggest, I mean, we all have music that we listen to that we like, yeah. styles of music, and since you don't actually play, to show an example of something that you like that is similar to what you're thinking is a great way, you know, for an example. 
Um, I mean, yeah, I think that is a, a great way. I, I think ultimately, though, I mean, the musician will cater towards <laughs> what you want to occur. You know, I, I think ultimately, like, your name is probably higher billing than the musician. So, I mean, on your podcast, um, and I, you're trying to be really nice to the musician, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I work with musicians every day. Right. And that's, I yeah. Know. Thank you for. Have you have you hung out with Tom James? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. I don't want to be the person they're talking shit about. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I agree. Like, I think just having a dialogue as to what kind of music you like and uh, um, is a good way to start as well. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> I think that's about yeah. I think if you have a lot of time and you find cooperative musicians, you could you could be as free form with it as you want. Where you are just going, you know, play something. No, that's not it. Yeah, play something. I mean, it's it's not it's not the most productive way to do it. But if everybody agrees up front that we're going to try this, uh, and if you feel strongly about the music that you hear becoming part of your work, um, I know lots of musicians who are. As long as you're paying them something, you know, they're happy to hang out, you know. If there's a sandwich involved, oh, even better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's what I'd say. I think there was another question uh, a couple rows. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, I guess this kind of goes with what we've been talking about. But earlier you said that um, soundtrack music supports film, right? Um, but then you also say that it's emotional. So I can see that there's a struggle between you know balancing these two things out so how do you guys work with that like I know how do you guys yeah how do you guys do that <laughs> let me just start because I think that I want to I'm going to attack you for what you just said okay. no <laughs> there's no struggle the, the beauty of music is that we can hear many things uh, one of the most beautiful things about Mozart operas is you get this one melody with this character and then another melody with another character and then another melody with another character and during the last scene of the opera they all come on stage singing totally different songs and it fits together like a glove and informs the story and and people start crying you know it's it, so there's no struggle it's possible to have different levels of energy going on and what you're seeing and what you're hearing and I, I think that, uh, you know, that that's one of the things that music does really well, is that it can work against the grain or inform part of the story we don't know yet or part of the story that we are remembering because we heard something in the music. And uh, I think all of that is really key to using music in your film. I don't know. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> How do you find that balance between um, have, making sure there's a lot of emotion in your music, but also having it be supportive? Like, it's not so distracting, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think when you watch a movie, uh, anybody, when anybody watches a movie, you you can empathize with the character, generally, unless you're like Donald Trump or something. <laughs> 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 you generally, it's, I think you, you can sense what these people are going through and um, and I, I feel like you can as a musician it has been your job and you've trained to do this but to call up these sort of emotions to convey through sound and I, I think you just sort of that's what you do you know what I mean and you can you can see this and that's what you sort of do I think I have to add too. I think it's pretty rare that I hear music fighting the picture it's, it's usually pretty rare, and there, I think the reason is for reason for that is that the person who's person who's made the movie is not going to let the they're not they're not going to let the action and the visual be dominated by a melody or or an orchestra that's too busy. It's just not going to happen. I I haven't heard it in a while. There's been a couple cases and like mm -hmm. seeing movies at at, um, at like film festivals and stuff like stuff that isn't done on a professional level, but I think most of the time the creator of the visual is going to say, that's too much. Th this is enough. Um, Opera is a little different, I think. <laughs> but um, did you want to add anything, Denise? Um, yeah, I think that 
it, depending on you know what you're writing to, and like I said, I, I do a lot of documentaries, so there's a lot of talking. And for me, from a technical standpoint, you know, frequency frequency wise, if you've got a bunch of dialogue that's right around here, don't choose an instrument that's going to play a melody that's also in the same area. You know, do something that's lower so that it's not going to interfere with the ear. So there's that technical approach to it. But, you know, like what you were saying, there's, um, there's this story that I always tell when, um, was it James Horner that did Titanic? Yes. Yep. The scene where um, Leonardo DiCaprio has died and he's letting go <laughs> of the piece of wood and just sinking down to the bottom. I should have been sobbing, and I wasn't. And that's the film that I always go to and, and think something more could have been done to draw that emotion out of me because this, this was a big scene. And I thought that he just really failed in that one spot. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's the, the one side of it and then there's that. It's like, why, how come I'm not crying, mm -hmm. you know? Did you feel like that when you first saw it or did you feel like that later? No, curious. when I first saw really? it. Well, I tend to really pay attention right. to that Tom kind of was stuff. I, was, I got sucked really? into that yeah. whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, like, yeah, I hate to admit it, but then like years later, I'm like, God, this is like... Rebel when Hollywood, I hear the no. song, it, it's, it's emotional for me. Really? Because now? I think of the entire film. Okay, sure. But I just noticed that one scene, and I noticed right. that in some other films too, randomly, that I should be crying. And I think that's why I choose films where... I can write music to make people cry because I'm trying to make up for all the times I didn't. <laughs> yeah, right on. Um, in front and then over here. So what was your question? Sorry. Um, I wonder if you can give any advice to someone like me who is just so technically inept. Uh, yeah, I, I took a course in Pro Tools and it just went right over my head. Um, so I, I keep getting dumber and dumber types of software. <laughs> And they're still over my head, and I, I looked for, you know, like strings, I looked at Garrity, I looked at East-West, and I thought, my God, there were 50,000 parameters there. How would I ever master something like that? I, I just don't know how to get over that learning curve. I've always lived by this rule, do what you do best, and what you can't do best, hire somebody. You know, and focus on, I mean, if you compose really well and you've got great ideas in your head, Hire somebody to do that for you, because it it will kill creativity yeah. if it's so taxing to try to figure that out. It's probably safe to add that sometimes hiring someone might be more accessible than you think. Like yeah. it could be sending a text message like, "Hey, can you help me out with this?" And people, I just went through this recently with with a new uh, trying to learn some new software. And it was a complete. It was a complete mess, and I called everybody. But um, you guys have any other advice for that? I was just going to say collaborate. You know, that find somebody that you do what you do, and find somebody that does what else needs to be done that you can't do. And that's exactly what she said. Yeah, if I had money to throw at the situation, though, I wouldn't have been buying all this software. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, but you might find somebody who would like to work with you and share their knowledge and learn something from you. I think we all have something to offer. Yeah, I think I think Sean's right. I think people are pretty much willing to help send you know if sending an email to somebody. I mean, like sending an email to me, I'd, I'd write back, you know. <laughs> but like, I you know I also, I get on YouTube frequently too, and like if I don't um, know how to do something, I just like in logic or whatever. I, <laughs> and there's like some 15 year old kid in England. <laughs> 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 Here's what you do, man. They're always, they're the problem is they quite speak quite and write like 15 year old kids. Yeah. Question up front here? Yeah. Um, what kinds of things do you wish you knew about the industry before you got into it? Ooh. <laughs> Did everyone hear that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what do you what do you wish you knew about the industry um, before you got into it? Yeah. It's funny because you, you just made me go past, you know, decades of um, 
when I first got into this, things were so different. I mean, it, it's like we didn't have digital. We had tape, you know. And there, I have a big book that I t that I got when I was taking film scoring classes about time code and what tempo you need to write at in order to um, be at this point in the film. I mean, mm -hmm. the math was incredible. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, well, that's a little off. Let me just shift it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think had I known where we were heading, I would have been running even faster to get into it because it's just so much easier now. Um, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I took a film scoring class. So I graduated college in... Uh, 1998 and so I had to do it like a little bit of that like like the math where you're like yeah you're trying to figure out where did the hit happens on the t on the frame and I remember I only had to do it once actually just the, the whole math thing and I did it and uh, I was totally off <laughs> I don't know what happened but the thing worked you know and it was like wow that like still works actually and uh, I was kind of amazed that like that happened like that I, I mean as far like I don't know there's a bit of like a cult of celebrity I think in the music industry in general, that um, it's not just film composition or whatever, but um, and people tend to be drawn towards the, I think, celebrity aspect and sort of what the brand, like, like um, what you can kind of pull out of the brand. <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, but I think the truth is, like, I, it's, it all goes back to musicianship, and I think um, even back then, I, I just wish I had like practiced more and mm -hmm. paid more attention to like my mentors and my teachers, and didn't like like think I was better than I am, and uh, I was maybe more humble and all that. And then um, I just kind of worked harder. Yeah, I worked hard enough, but I didn't work hard enough. <laughs> I, have, I have something. Yeah. You got something? No, go ahead. No, I really all I could say is that I, I've been really lucky where the stuff I was supposed to know, that I I don't recall ever having a penalty for not knowing it, but I had a lot of near misses where it would happen, and I'd go, oh, that's how they do that, you know. And then the <laughs> next time I'd know. So I I don't know. I can't put my finger on anything that I wish I'd have known. But I'm just you know I, it's been a thing where I've been lucky learning as I've gone. So. Uh, I would agree with. I would agree with Tom to like um, like focus on musicianship as much as possible. But the other thing too that I don't think it's said enough is like we're we're in this we're in this world now where like it's super easy to connect with people uh, in different places. So rather than like back in the day, 17, 18 years ago, being like, man, I I, I wish uh, I could get a scoring gig or I could do like even a commercial or something. Like, you can think that and then, like, later in the afternoon meet someone who's doing that. Like, you don't have to wait around for someone to call you or for someone to discover you. You can just, you can be part of the production team and be like, hey, I'll be the, I'll be the, what is that called? <laughs> boom op. <laughs> boom, boom op. I'll be the boom op and I'll do the music. <laughs> and then, like, this thing will get done and then you'll be proud of it. And then it's like so much easier to do the next thing because within that process of completing something, you're going to learn so much more than than sitting around practicing, waiting for a call to come in. Like rather than being like a work for hire, you can just go find someone to make something. That's cool, I think. Whether it's an animation or someone you know is doing a, I say I say commercial, but nowadays it's like everybody's making a commercial because they have to get on. Facebook and you know put a video to advertise their their book fair or something. So I think it's just so much easier now to go out and get something done. Uh, maybe like one last question. I think we're gonna wrap it up here or two more. Back way back and then we'll do you. to like live music um, I just feel like there's this um, like you guys were talking about there's like this this source or the sense of like attraction um, towards that 
because um, like I'll listen to like a track list of a musical and then you know it sounds completely different and ten times more lively when you know we're performing it. So um, I don't know. I just feel like like live music has always like I've always felt like that about that like listening to like Nirvana or the Beatles or stuff like that. It kind of just um, like it, it takes me back in time. And, <laughs> but like, I feel like, um, like you were talking about EDM music, um, like I feel like there's also be beginning to to build uh, like a sense of attraction in, in that area as well. So I, I'm I'm thinking like this is kind of a yes or a no question. Um, do you feel that that music will eventually hit a point where there's a need for a revolution? Um, whether that be a hybrid of music, maybe hip hop and EDM, or um, you know, um, electronic, maybe because with all the plugins that have been coming out for the past decade, um, mu digital music is is hitting a peak right now. I feel um, personally, as a producer and in progress engineer, I feel it's hitting a peak to where um, you can make things sound a lot through digital. So I guess, um, would you agree with me that um, eventually, like you, you said that, that robots eventually will take over like, <laughs> um, everything. Would you agree that eventually like, like maybe di digital music will, I don't want to say overpower, but like, um, I don't know, me personally, I feel that it would be dope to do like a, a live EDM concert somehow like actual people. Well, uh, do you know, um, do you know like this, like this guy, Michael Maynard? Do, you, do you, anybody know him? He, he's sort of a producer guy. Um, I guess he taught pretty lights, like everything he knows, apparently. That's so I hear. Um, but he's sort of a local guy. Um, it, he was doing stuff like, like everything sort of, well, because a lot of those guys just get up there with a laptop, right? And they just hit play and they kind of like play flash. Yeah. Like yeah, like Tetris or something. Something <laughs> more relevant. I grew up like in the Nintendo age, so we played Tetris. But um, uh, but he he like it was kind of cool because um, he had a bunch of live music. He had two live drummers, which I don't think that's probably necessary. But he had two live drummers, and then he had like a whole horn section and like uh, string players. But and, and it was all kind of playing against his beats and everything that he created and. Um, it was kind of ridiculous because I actually ended up playing violin on that con on one of the concerts and like, yeah, I don't know, it's just crazy because like they're, they're all smoking weed and I had like two hours. I got like five kids at home, you know, and um, <laughs> and like I can't smoke weed because like, I gotta go home and like make sure they practice their violin and stuff. But um, <laughs> they like, uh, <laughs> but anyways, I, I think that is happening already. Just yeah. like you have electronic music and I mean even bands like New Order and stuff back in the day were you know they like. Peter Hook would be playing bass, and and there's all these drum machines and stuff going, and um, you know Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails, and so I, I think it, that will always be the case, you know. Well, I I think too, kind of what you're talking about, you know, you're talking, you're referencing like Nirvana and the Beatles, and we can all agree that, you know, I I bet most people in this room love those those artists, and and. Um, if I'm hearing you right, I think maybe part of it is you gotta you gotta like search out what speaks to you, and don't be afraid to like incorporate it into what you're doing. Like if if you're doing stuff on Ableton and you're using certain plugins or whatever, and it's, you're feeling uninspired, then it's maybe time to shift, and don't be afraid to find someone who's playing something, whether it's a guitar or a violin or whatever it is. Don't be afraid to collaborate with them. If you're feeling like, you know, I call it like making music in the box. If everything you're doing is on a screen and it's not, it's it doesn't have like a real world. Because I use Ableton too, but if you need if you need to go grab some stuff that's inspiring from the real world, whatever that may be, it's got to do it. I think. And we're up front here. Yeah, um, huge Devotka Devotka fan. Um, I'd like to. I'm curious about the process for how 
how Little Miss Sunshine happened and, and how that how that worked out. Did you guys collaborate? Was it uh, how much time did you have and all that good stuff? Uh, Little Miss Sunshine was um, he's he's asking how how Devotchka, um did Little Miss Sunshine and that was kind of a happy accident because the the directors heard a song on the radio. They wanted to use a, they wanted to use a kind of soundtrack that was similar to. Midnight Cowboy with Dustin Hoffman and a song that's used in that movie is called Everybody's Talking by Harry Nelson. Harry, Harry, Harry Nelson. Yeah. If you go back and listen to it, that guitar <coughs> and that, that song keeps playing through the soundtrack. So that's what they were going for. And these guys had already been um, they already cut their teeth by making a famous Volkswagen commercial that used Nick Drake's song and and um, I think everybody if, if you've seen that commercial you know what we're talking about so these guys they they're pioneers of marrying sound to film and not pioneers they're they're uh, groundbreaking so um, and they made they made Nick Drake's posthumous com career um, <laughs> and so then they they asked what we what we could do it was terribly confusing for in the beginning and seeing seeing these edits like while we're backstage getting ready to play a show in LA and warming up it was just it, it just seemed incredibly surreal to see Greg Kinnear and Steve Carell and, uh, and then we weren't trusted in the end so they brought in an outside composer and the outside composer uh, did his best to work with a band, but also was already steeped in LA soundtrack, the LA soundtrack machine, and um, and had to. He, he was there to fill in the gaps. Um, so a lot of it was songs from a record, <coughs> embellished with uh, more music by an LA composer. And I would say he took the thematic material from the Devotchka records and then. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, okay. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, it was, it was like it was like adaptations. And at this time, we knew. I mean, we knew so little about making music in this capacity that we were. Um, it was like elation, stress, confusion, <laughs> and and then um, and in the end, we had no one. No one knew that it was going to be the kind of cultural phenomenon that every filmmaker hopes <laughs> happens, where they spend a little bit of money. And it blows up. Yeah. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Cool. But um, one last question here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm curious. We talked a lot about the relationship with filmmakers and directors. Um, kind of from the filmmaker side of things, at every point in the process, from pre-production right on through to post, what could be done from a filmmaker's perspective in building that strong relationship with the composer to make the the best collective product possible from both a sound and, and film perspective. Everyone hear that one? Cool. You guys? I, I think that, uh, that if you've got a director that listens to a lot of music and knows kind of the flavor he wants for a certain scene or something like that and can be uh, can commit to that direction verbally with you uh, it makes it super easy to, to uh, not super easy, uh, it makes it easier to, to get to get the process going, and uh, and, and so uh, from the from the composer side, you have to not be afraid to write a lot of music that doesn't work. I mean, not a lot, but um, uh, it's not unusual at all to write a piece of music I love that goes with the scene and have the director go, "What are you doing?" And uh, and then other times, you know, um, I'll go back and try to write something else, and you know, the director will go, oh, "That's exactly." perfect you know that's what I had in mind so I, I it's like any other relationship that there's a lot of give and take and um, there has to be real open communication and uh, and nobody should you know get too upset when things aren't going well because that's sort of part of the process in my opinion um, you know I think most musicians and composers and film composers are can are kind of chameleon like in the sense that they can kind of sort of hack the vibe of every genre if if need be but um and I, I think a lot of composers have you know better skill sets at certain things and I, I think if you know the person you're working with it's helpful but um for instance like an edm soundtrack if someone asked me to do that 
I had to do this thing for this play, and I actually got on YouTube because I had to do it like kind of a uh, like a like a dubstep beat thing. And I, <laughs> like I don't listen really to dubstep. And so I got on YouTube and I went to the 15 year old kid from England and like, <laughs> like this is how you do a dubstep beat. And, and uh, <laughs> so I kind of copied what he did and I moved things around and um, and it worked. But I'm probably not the best like dubstep composer. Um, so I think it's kind of helpful to know who you're working with, um, but to also know that they're adaptable and that they're willing to generally try to make you happy as the ultimate creative um, god of the project. <laughs> I think that all of that's very true and it's about respect. It's about mm -hmm. respecting um, a director's project. It's your baby. But it's also about hiring somebody that you respect as well who knows what they're doing. And it's about meeting in the middle and you know, not stepping on anybody's toes and listening. And um, there was a very funny story that I heard um, many years ago. I worked for Bill Ross, who uh, is a film composer, did a lot of work for David Foster, does a lot of the um, orchestrations for the Emmys, and um, just a really nice and talented man, and very well respected. And he was saying that he sat with a director who said, you know, this is what I hear in this scene, and he thought, well, I, I kind of disagree, but I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, you know, be opposing, so I'm just going to do what he wants, I'm going to go home and I'm going to write that cue, but I'm also going to write the one I think would be better. Mm -hmm. And then he would present the one that the director wanted, and then he would present his. So rather than convince the director that he knew best, let me just take the time and show him. And I thought that was a great approach because that's total respect. That's cool. Well, right on. Hey, thank you everyone for coming. I want to thank Tim, Tom, Denise for being here. Round of applause. Thank you, John. Thank you. And, uh, we'll be hanging out if you guys want to ask any more questions. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, nice to meet you. Are you uh,